very much, everyone, for coming out. It was, uh, and I want to thank my colleagues, Ryan and Manal, who's filming at the back. You can't just be a fellow at Democracy Now! without doing um, research, writing, and filming everywhere. Um, uh, and we're also here this weekend for the National Conference on Media Reform, which is taking place in Boston, where thousands of people will come to talk about the media system in this country. But it was wonderful. I also want to thank Dennis Moynihan, who is here, who um, uh, co-wrote with me the last book uh, that's here called Breaking the Sound Barrier, our book of columns over the last three years. And I hope that you'll sign the Daily Digest, which is being passed around by volunteers and Democracy Now! t-shirts, um, which keeps you updated on the news of the day. Um, and also, we send out media alerts um, when uh, various issues and breaking news are happening. But to walk over here was really something today. I almost went into the union thinking I was here for dinner, uh, but I controlled myself. It definitely brings back memories. Um, in fact, this time of year, many years ago, uh, I was going to be defending my thesis. And I was in anthropology here. Um, I wrote my thesis in medical anthropology. Uh, I was looking at a contraceptive drug called Depo-Provera, which is injected into a woman's arm uh, once every three months. At the time, in 1984, it wasn't approved by the Food and Drug Administration, but it had been injected into 10,000 black women in Atlanta, Georgia, um, at the Grady Charity Hospital. They did not know it wasn't approved by the FDA. When I went down to investigate, I saw in the Family Planning Clinic the booklet, and it just was called The Shot. Um, it also is injected to women, into women all over the world, um, millions of women. It was produced at the time by the Upjohn Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I wondered how a drug could be sent all over the world that wasn't approved here, that caused cancer in beagles and monkeys and injected in women here without them knowing that they were, well, human experiments. So I looked at this drug and it came time to defend my thesis. So before me were three professors in biological anthropology and cultural anthropology, which I was in, social anthropology, and archaeology. And I was very excited to be leaving, and it would be in a few weeks. And the archaeologists in the group, at that time, they smoked in the room. <laughs> he took a grab of his pipe. And he started to push the thesis back towards me, which made me extremely nervous. <laughs> and he said, Ms. Goodman, <laughs> what is your definition of anthropology? <laughs> because he said, I think this is more sociology, which I had not taken courses in, was getting very nervous that I would have to go back to school for four years. <laughs> then it is a degree in anthropology. And I knew if I'm going to leave, I better agree with him on the definition. So I said, well, doctor, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Why don't you tell me your definition of anthropology? And he said, well, it is to be a participant observer in someone else's culture. And that is your problem here, why we probably cannot accept this. Because you are looking at your own culture. And I said, no, I actually agree with you that that is the definition of anthropology, that you get a distance by being a participant observer in someone else's culture. I'm looking at the practice of science in America today, very much a white male corporate establishment. I said, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> so I was very excited to graduate. And, um, and as I thought about who read my thesis, these three men, I thought, it would, since I'd spent so much time 
researching it. It probably would be important to get it out to more people than the three men who probably wouldn't be using it. <laughs> Deva Prevera, that is. <laughs> so I worked with a colleague who is also here, Christina von Henneberg, and uh, we turned the thesis into a series of articles for the um, multinational monitor. That was a publication established by Ralph Nader and journalist Alan Nair. Uh, and the issue was called The Case Against Depo Provera. And as I was writing it back in New York, I started to listen to a radio station in New York. I grew up in New York, but I really didn't listen to the radio when I was growing up. And as I was doing this work, I tuned into 99.5 FM WBAI, and I could not believe what I was listening to. All of the grit, the beauty, the horror of New York, and all its myriad accents. It was the best of radio. It was the worst of radio. It had no corporate agenda. It wasn't breaking every five minutes to bring you a commercial. I was just mesmerized. But I was also on this track. I was very interested in nutrition and biochemistry. I had taken a number of courses at the School of Public Health. So I went to the local school in New York City, Hunter, to take biochemistry courses. And I saw down the hall that they were teaching a radio documentary course. I thought, oh, that's what I listened to on the radio. So I'll just stop in there. And I was mesmerized. And the person who was teaching, the professor, was a producer at this radio station I was listening to, WBAI. And I asked if I could apprentice with him. Um, he took me to WBAI that night. It was 1984, um, and more than a quarter of a century later, I really have never left. I found at the beginning of my career what journalists look for their whole lives, and that's independence. BAI was part of the Pacifica Network, founded in 1949 in Berkeley, California, by a man named Lou Hill, who was a war resistor. When he came out of the detention camps, he said, there's got to be a media outlet, not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born, the first station, KPFA, 1949. Not run by corporations is uh, George Gervner, the uh, late dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania, said, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. The second Pacific Station, KPFK in Los Angeles, 1959. My station, New York, BAI, 1960. 1977, WPFW in Washington. 1970, the fourth of the five stations, KPFT went on the air in Houston, Texas. Uh, that created quite a firestorm. Um, after a few weeks of being on the air in Houston, Texas, the Ku Klux Klan straight strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter. It's the only radio station in the country that was blown to smithereens. This was the spring of 1970. And when they got themselves back together and they rebuilt their transmitter, the Klan blew it up again. I think it was in the middle of Guthrie's, Alice's Restaurant, that was on the air at the time. Um, I can't remember if it was the Exalted Cyclops or the Grand Dragon, because I often confuse their titles. <laughs> um, but he said it was his proudest act. And I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is, how dangerous independent media is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it is an uncle in Iraq, a little girl in Afghanistan, whether it's a great uncle in Afghanistan, in, in Libya. You say, it sounds like my baby, my bubba, my mother, my father. You don't have to agree. But when you hear a voice, when you know who someone's mother is, when you learn about where they live, it just makes it less likely that you're going to caricature or stereotype, which only adds fuel to the hate groups. I see the media as the greatest force for peace in the world if used responsibly, which it definitely isn't in the United States. But the potential, the power. I've been thinking a lot about Japan because of the catastrophe that continues to unfold there. Right, with the earthquake and then the tsunami and the partial meltdown and who knows how much worse. But what 
the people of Japan have been dealing back go, dealing with. Let's go back to the dawn of the nuclear age, right? They were its targets. The only nuclear bombs dropped dropped by the United States in Japan, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Do you know how those cities were chosen? Because they were military bases now. Um, the Pentagon, the War Department at the time, made a list of cities. And the Secretary of War, Stimson, um, looked at the list and he saw Kyoto on the list. He said, no, my wife and I visited there. It's a beautiful city. So he scratched that one off the list. But you see, there's something very powerful about that. He knew the city. He had met people. It makes it much less likely you would want to destroy a community if you know something about it. It also reminds me of another example of independent media. The coverage of the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. General MacArthur at the time put the whole area off limits. So the press just went to the boat, uh, the ship off the shore of Japan as the Japanese were surrendering. But not one man, Wilfred Burchett, an Australian independent journalist who went for 30 hours in a train until he made it to Hiroshima. He stepped out and could not believe his eyes. A longtime war correspondent, he'd never seen anything like this, a moonscape where there once was a city. The shadows of people ingrained in the sides of whatever walls remained. He saw people running, their skin was melting off. He didn't have a word for what he saw. He called it the atomic plague. And he sat down in the rubble with his Hermes typewriter, and he tapped out the words, I write this as a warning to the world. There was another journalist, William Lawrence, from the New York Times, who wrote a series of articles, 10 articles, extolling the power, the virtue, the beauty of the dropping of the bombs. People didn't quite understand at the time that he was also writing press releases for the Pentagon, for the War Department. He was on the payroll of the Pentagon, also for the New York Times. He wrote a series of articles, and the New York Times at the beginning had said it was Japanese war propaganda. I mean, what Burchett wrote in his warning to the world rocked this country, and they had to counter it. Um, so the Times had this series of articles, and Lawrence won the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. I recently I speak at the Journalism School at Columbia where the Pulitzer is based and uh, a few years ago instead of going to teach a class I just went over the Pulitzer Committee and presented my, um, I suppose you could say a protest saying that the New York Times should be stripped of this particular Pulitzer. We need unembedded journalists. I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. You know what I mean by embedding, where reporters are embedded in the front lines of troops in Iraq or Afghanistan. I'm not saying the people who do that aren't brave. But you have to get reporting from outside of that. What do you think you're going to get if you are embedded with the front, in the front lines of troops? You're eating with them, sleeping with them, your life depends on that. That's reporting from one perspective. If you're going to have that, you need reporters embedded in Iraqi hospitals and Afghan communities and the peace movement around the world to understand the repercussions of war. And not only must we challenge the embedding process in the military, but being embedded in the establishment in Washington. We need an independent press. My brother and I, David, who graduated the year before me, but we lived in the co-op together here um, at Harvard. We wrote a book called Static. Well, our first book was called The Exception to the Rulers. That's the motto of democracy now, but it should be the motto of all the media, The Exception to the Rulers. Our second book was called Static. And the reason we called it that is because in this high-tech digital age with high-definition television and digital radio, still all we ever get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality. When what we need the media to give us is the dictionary definition of static. Criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. A media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. 
and a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. We need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. I just flew in from Minneapolis. Democracy Now, by the way, is based in New York. But I was in Minneapolis this week, along with two of my Democracy Now! colleagues, Nicole Salazar and Shreve Bokadus. Um, we are suing the Minneapolis and St. Paul police departments and the federal authorities for our arrests um, in St. Paul, covering the Republican Convention in 2008. And we were being deposed by the police lawyers this week. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And the reason I bring this up now is because of this issue of the embedding process, what we were attempting to do, and what it's so important we ensure happens in this country when it comes to the media, ensure our independence. You know, we have flown from the Democratic Convention in Denver, right, to the Republican convention to cover it. We were doing two day, two hours a day of expanded coverage. How many of you have heard or listened to or read Democracy Now? Um, well, it's wonderful to see that. And by the way, a huge shout out to friends here at SCAT TV at Somerville Community Access Television who are recording. Uh, you can watch Democracy Now on SCAT TV, uh, channel three, eight noon, uh, Monday eight and noon, Monday through Friday. Uh, Boston College also runs Democracy Now! WZBC, 90.3 FM, noon, Monday through Friday. You can get us on satellite TV and, of course, on the web at democracynow.org. And the transcripts, you can send them around, share them. Um, it's one of the most content-rich websites online. I mean, the transcript of every show, every day, for the full hour um, is there. And we translate our headlines into Spanish and over 300 radio stations run the headlines in Spanish and you can take that information there as well. But we have a huge responsibility broadcasting on over 900 public radio and television stations around the country and around the world, PBS stations, NPR stations, Pacifica stations, college stations. You could ask the Harvard station to run us. Um, <laughs> um, a huge responsibility when we go somewhere to get this work done. And so we were just doing our jobs. And Monday morning was Labor Day, September 1st, 2008, of the Republican Convention. The convention was starting in the afternoon, a huge peace march in the morning, uh, marching from St. Paul City Hall to the Excel Center. <coughs> 10,000 people led by soldiers, either vets or active duty soldiers, some in uniform. And they're taking great risks when they do this. But they had either served in Afghanistan and Iraq or were refusing to serve. And of course, thousands of civilians marching. Republican, Democrat, Independent. And we were covering that. It was a beautiful blue sky day. And then I went inside. You know, I have the top security clearance to interview presidents and vice presidents, the delegates. Um, and went inside to start interviewing people. I was interviewing the delegates from Alaska, the hottest state. Um, and my colleagues went to start to digitize tape. We were working at the SCAN equivalent, <coughs> the CCTV. We also broadcast right here in Cambridge, wonderful station that's moving to bigger quarters in Central Square, where you can, anyone can learn to do television. And it's so important that you make your own media, you put the me back in media. Um, but we were broadcasting from SPNN, St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and the, Nicole and Sharif were there digitizing tape. They heard a commotion outside. Nicole grabs the camera, um, and Sharif grabs the microphone, and they race downstairs. They wouldn't be doing their jobs if they weren't covering what was happening. So I'm on the floor interviewing the delegates, and I get a call from one of our senior producers, Mike Burke. He said, come quickly to 7th and Jackson. Nicole and Sharif have been arrested. I think they've been hurt. He said, what are you talking about? So I run with our camera person, Rick Rowley of Big Noise Films, another great independent journalist, and you should look at his coverage of Iraq and Afghanistan. So he's got the camera, and we're running, running to 7th and Jackson. We get there, there's a full riot police line that has uh, enclosed the whole area, but it's fully contained at this point. People are inside, they're just alone outside, fully <coughs> dressed in black from head to foot with their shields and um, riot gear. So I'm running along the line. I don't want to cross the police line, but I want to find the commanding officer. You know, I have to get our reporters out there. They've got credentials like I have. 
and got to get them out before they were being processed or lose them for the week. But more importantly, I heard they were hurt and I needed to know that they were okay. So I run along the line, they don't see a commanding officer. I stop quickly uh, and I ask one of the officers, excuse me, I'd like to speak to your commanding officer. I'm an accredited journalist, you can see I had all the credentials on. My two colleagues are inside, they're accredited like I am. I need to speak to your uh, supervising officer. It wasn't seconds before he ripped me through the police line, twisted my arms back, others police joined. They threw me against a car, slapped handcuffs on me behind my back, threw me up against the wall and onto the ground. I said, please don't arrest me. I just want to ha make sure my colleagues are okay and have them free. They're accredited journalists. It didn't matter and I wasn't using my hands because they were behind my back and they hurt. And I was looking desperately over this big parking lot. Where is Sharif? Where is Nicole? I finally saw Nicole, Sharif, across the parking lot, his hands behind his back. I couldn't see Nicole. Um, I asked the officer to take me to Sharif. I finally am brought to him, but my hands are really hurting. I asked the officer, could you please, I'm starting not to feel one of my hands, could you please loosen the handcuffs? He makes them tighter. Um, <clears throat> so I'm standing with Sharif. And we are saying we are journalists, you should not be arresting us. You can see our credentials, they're around our necks. So that's when the Secret Service came and ripped the credentials from around our necks. So I'm brought into the police wagon after I'm processed and I'm demanding to see Nicole. She's in the police wagon. She quickly told me what happened. She said they had raced down. There were some protesters, mainly riot police. She started filming. She was in the parking lot. The riot police came at her information. She's still filming. She's holding up her press pass. She didn't plan to film her own violent arrest, but that's what happened. They're screaming on your face, on your face. She's screaming back, press, press, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. She's showing her press pass. She's filming. They come at her. They're saying, get back. She's saying, where? She's against parked cars. Then police come from behind her and in front of her, and they take her down on her face, bloodying her face. She's down on the ground. Her camera tumbles. Uh, they've got knee or boot in her back. She couldn't determine which. And they're pulling on her leg, and because she's on her face, they're bloodying her face. The first thing the police do is take the battery out of her camera. If you were wondering what it was, they wanted to stop happening. Sharif comes running over. He says to the police, please calm down, calm down. He's got the microphone. They throw him up against a wall, kick him twice in the chest. They take him down. They bloody his arm. He still has scars in his arm, and they handcuff him. So I am taken off to the police cages um, where they're holding the protesters in the garage. And Sharif and Nicole are taken to jail. I want to speed up the story, but it was because thousands of people wrote in, called in, tweeted, faxed, did everything. Because they saw the videotape of my arrest and Nicole's arrest, immediately it went up online. It went viral. Uh, most watched YouTube video the first two days of the Republican Convention. It was astounding. We got out of jail faster than, Sharif was in jail with the AP photographer. They arrested more than 40 journalists that week. And he was in jail with the AP photographer. Sharif got out before the AP photographer did. Um, I then was brought to the convention center. Lots of people wanted to interview me. We've got to do a two hour show the next day. Um, and I'm in the NBC skybox and I told a story. Um, and as the, when the cameras turned off, the NBC reporter says, I don't get it. Um, he said, why wasn't I arrested? And I said, oh. I said, did you go outside to cover the protest? He said, no. I said, well, the thing is, I'm not getting arrested in the skybox either. <laughs> you know, yes, Woody Allen says 90% of life is just showing up. And we have a job to do. We have to cover what's happening at the convention. We've got to get into these corporate suites, see who's sponsoring the Republican Governors Association, the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee in Denver. All of that, we've got to eat a lot of hors d'oeuvres to find out who it is who's paid for them. And we've got to get out into the streets where the thousands of uninvited guests are who also have something <coughs> to say. Democracy is a messy thing. And it's our job to capture it all. And we shouldn't have to get a record when we try to put things on the record. The next day I race off to Police Chief John Harrington's news conference. He's the police chief of St. Paul. The police officer opens the door to the news conference, happens to be the man who processed me in the police cages. I said, you not only have to let me into this news conference, you have to let me out when it's done. <laughs> so, Harrington's taking questions. I raise my hand, I describe what happened to Nicole, what happened to Sharif. Both of them bloodied, both of them arrested, both face felony riot charges. 
Iowa faced uh, misdemeanor. I was arrested with a misdemeanor uh, interfering with a peace officer, if only there was a peace officer. <laughs> and I said, what instructions have you given the police and how do you expect us to operate in this atmosphere? And he said, you can embed. You can embed with the mobile field force. Yeah. Embed. So the process that has brought the media to an all-time low, embedding in the front lines of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, is now the model of how we will cover American cities. This all must be challenged. We need an independent press. We are extolling that. We're hailing that all over the Middle East now. When a journalist is arrested, we all are horrified, as we should be. Well, from the rolling rebellions in the Middle East to the Midwest here in this country, we have to have a consistent philosophy about what it means to shore up a democratic society, and that is to have independent reporters. Well, let me bring this to 1991, um, because it's a great honor to be brought here by the Kennedy School, the Center for Public Leadership, the Gleitzman Fellowship, that also made me think, as I came here, of coming to the Kennedy School in 1991, I think it was, um, because a uh, man was graduating um, who was being sued by Guatemalan peasants and an American nun. His name was Hector Gramajo. He was a Guatemalan general. He did a mid-life uh, Got, was getting a midlife graduate degree at the Kennedy School, and it was graduation day. And I came up along with another colleague um, to follow <laughs> the Center for Constitutional Rights lawyers and a private investigator who were slapping Ramajo with a lawsuit on behalf of, oh, something like eight or nine Guatemalan families who were the deaths of their loved ones or the torture of Guatemalans who made it out. Uh, General Gramajo had boasted about raising, destroying hundreds of communities in the Northwest Highlands of Guatemala. He slapped with a lawsuit that almost looked like a diploma and he was wearing his graduation uh, <laughs> gown. He was walking into the Kennedy School about to um, go in for the ceremony. It was very interesting because I was there covering it for Pacifica. ABC, though, did something slightly different. They called the Kennedy School and they said, can we cover this? Because that night Diane Sawyer was doing a special on Gramajo, a special on actually the American nun, Sister Diana Ortiz, who was raped and mutilated in Guatemala. Uh, she was taken by the Guatemala security forces under Gramajo. She was uh, burned with a cigarette 101 times on her back. Um, uh, and she, a few days later, they filed, they slapped him with another lawsuit. And because it was called Prime Time Live that Diane Sawyer was doing at the time, they always had a live component. And so they wanted to film Gramajo graduating from Harvard Kennedy School as the sort of final part of this piece. But the Kennedy School said no, they, they couldn't film. Now, I knew that the graduations are open and how many video cameras are out at graduation. <laughs> of course you could just come up and film. So that's what I was there to do. I don't think um, that to ask permission to cover such an important news event uh, was necessary. And so I went up to Hector Gramajo as we were photographing him getting slapped with this lawsuit, and I asked General Gramajo, how do you feel? This is a lawsuit charging with crimes against humanity as you get your Harvard degree today. And he said, don't make me out to be some tin pot dictator. I am the product, like so many here, of the American educational system. <laughs> the suit was filed on behalf of Hector Gramajo. Um, on behalf of the Guatemalan peasants, and then a few days later, as he was packing up on behalf of Sister Diana Ortiz, at that time, he was much more savvy, and he spit on the uh, investigator who, who served him. Um, the judge in the case in Boston uh, found against him $47 million, uh, which, of course, he never paid. In 2004, General Hector Bermajo was killed in a swarm of killer bees on his farm. <laughs> it's very important that we take responsibility, that we know about history, 
whether we're talking about Guatemala, whether we're talking about Egypt, whether we're talking about Afghanistan or Iraq. For those of you who listen to or watch or read Democracy Now!, you know the astounding coverage that Sharif Abdel Qadus brought you from Egypt for the 18 days that rocked the world, the Egyptian uprising. Um, Sharif flew home uh, immediately as this was unfolding. Um, senior producer of Democracy Now!, he comes from uh, one of the well-known, most well-known families in Egypt. His grandfather, Hassan Abdel Qadus, is the most famous writer of Egypt. His great-grandmother is Rosa Yusuf. She founded the magazine, a great Egyptian feminist a magazine that continues to this day. As he flew in, um, <coughs> Democracy Now! is, to say the least, very gritty and scrappy when it comes to breaking sound barriers. When Jeremy Skeha was in Iraq uh, during Saddam Hussein's time, uh, Saddam Hussein had put up a firewall, making it very difficult to get out video and audio and reports. And, we used a computer system, a program that allowed us, it's like putting it through a screen door, sending 150 email out and then piecing it back together in New York. And when Sharif went, you know that the system was brought down entirely. Uh, Mubarak had uh, the internet and the cell phone system. He just hit the kill switch. Um, Sharif joked after, that was Mubarak's first mistake. You know, uh, Egyptians are very computer savvy, love to tweet, love to go on Facebook. He said if he hadn't brought down the internet system, everyone would probably stayed home and just gone on Facebook and figured out what was going on and tweeting each other, never gone to top rear. But all of a sudden, the internet was dead, so we had to go out and see for yourselves what was happening. Uh, he tells another joke about uh, Nasser and uh, um, Sadat. Uh, on a day that Mubarak passes, meets them at the pearly gates, and um, you know Nasser was uh, died of a heart attack. Sadat was assassinated, and they say to Mubarak, "What happened? Was it bullets or a heart attack?" He said, "Facebook." <laughs> <laughs> um, but these uprisings and how significant they are, and understanding how um, the despots try to shut them down, and who these despots are. Um, how important it is to understand who these despots are. Um, Mubarak, how does he last for 30 years? So despised by the people of Egypt. Well, unfortunately, he had an armor, a coat of armor made in the USA. Right. $2 billion a year, only more Israel. It was Israel and then Egypt. But $2 billion a year. The companies Raytheon and Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed Martin. Two billion dollars. It actually didn't really even go into Egypt very much, certainly went to Mubarak somewhat, but more as Bill Hartung, who just wrote a book called Profits of War about Lockheed Martin, talked about it as corporate welfare for the corporations of this country, <coughs> Libya. Um, Muammar Gaddafi just two years ago. General Dynamics signed a more than $160 million weapons deal. The U.S. just signed with Saudi Arabia the largest arms deal in the history of the United States right before these uprisings. And now Gaddafi is using these weapons against <coughs> his own people. We have to take responsibility for what we do, for the role the U.S. plays in the world, whether we're talking Egypt, whether we're talking Tunisia, whether we're talking about Bahrain, whether we're talking about Wisconsin, these uprisings <laughs> from the Middle East to the Midwest. We have a responsibility to be there, to show what is happening, to bring out the voices of people everywhere. Um, just last week, I flew to Johannesburg on the longest continuous flight in the world from New York to Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, because a historic event was about to take place, the former president of Haiti, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, was daring to end his exile after seven years in South Africa and try to return home to Haiti. Democracy Now! has covered Haiti for many years. Um, Haiti is such an important country for us all to know about. Born in 1804, a slave rebellion, the first black republic in the world, the U.S. would not recognize Haiti for decades because the U.S. Congress members were afraid it would inspire slaves in the United States to rise up. And France. France demanded reparations from Haiti. 
um, compensation because they couldn't get slave labor from Haiti anymore once they became a republic. And Haiti paid those reparations to France right through World War II. Now, in 1986, as Jean-Bertrand Aristide describes it, Haiti had its uprising, like the uprising in Tahrir. People were tired. People would not take the repression of the Duvaliers, <coughs> Papa Doc Duvalier and Jean-Claude Duvalier, who's just recently returned to Haiti, and they rose up. And in those next years, they prepared for the first democratic elections, and they elected this fiery young priest named Jean-Bertrand Aristide. He became president in 1990 and 1991. Within a year, he would be thrown out of office in a who, unfortunately, backed by the United States. The U.S. was working with a FRAP, but Emmanuel Constant FRAP was the paramilitary death squad there. It means to punch. Emmanuel Constant was its head. It was on, he was on the payroll of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and working with the CIA. And for the next three years, as Aristide was forced out of the country, thousands of Haitians were killed. President Clinton though not supporting President Aristide, not wanting him to return, had a dilemma. Thousands of Haitians were washing up on Florida shores. He would lose Florida if he didn't do something about the wave of Haitian refugees. And so finally, he forced President Aristide to cry uncle. He would return Aristide to Haiti if he would agree not to serve out his full term. He lost the three years in the coup. He wouldn't get those three years when he came back. So we would only have another year to go. But if you want to discourage coups, wouldn't it make sense that it would discourage the coosters if you said, if you do that, these democratically elected leaders will come back and serve their full term. But no, that's not what he was allowed to do when he was flown back in a US military plane. I was there in the palace grounds when President Aristide returned, and the response was overwhelming. You know, one of his first acts when he first became president before he was thrown out was to increase the minimum wage of the people of Haiti. And his first act when he flew back was to say, we're disbanding the army, we're disbanding the military. That's very problematic for the United States because so often that's the relationship they have with these countries. It's with their militaries. They were not pleased. Aristide served another year. He left office. And then in 2000, he ran again. In 2004, he was ousted once again in a U.S. back coup. The number two man in the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince, Luis Moreno, went to the home of the Aristides. He told them they were getting on a plane. They said they wanted to speak to the press. He said he'd take them to the press. They thought they were going to the press to meet them at the airport, and they were hustled on a plane with an American flag with military and security on that plane. They did not know where they were going, and they were sent off to the Central African Republic, a dictator that responded to the presidents of France and U.S. Oh, did I mention that in 2004, the bicentennial of Haiti, when they should have been celebrating remarkable 200 years of development, President Aristide said he wanted reparations back from France for all that France had paid to, all that Haiti had paid to France. So he was ousted again. I went to the Central African Republic two weeks later with a small delegation on a much too small plane that was led by Congressmember Maxine Waters and the founder of TransAfrica, Randall Robinson, and a member of the Jamaican parliament named uh, Sharon Hay Webster. She was bringing an invitation from the Prime Minister, P.J. Patterson, to invite the Aristides at least to Jamaica. And so they went there, and I was covering this whole trip. I was the only reporter, oh, with the uh, print reporter, with Peter Eisner of the Washington Post. And they negotiated with uh, Bazize, the uh, dictator, and they got him onto the plane, Aristide, and Mildred Aristide, the first lady, and brought him back to, well, they tried, back to this hemisphere. As Rumsfeld, Rice, and Powell, Secretary of State Powell at the time, were saying, the Aristides were not to return to this hemisphere. Randall wow. Robinson said, whose hemisphere? <laughs> and the U.S. Ambassador to Haiti, Foley, said the, um, the Aristides were not to return to Haiti. Whose country? So they returned to Jamaica, and then they sought exile in South Africa, where they remained for seven years, until I got the call. But if I headed to South Africa, maybe I could get on that much too small plane again. And 
see if they would make it back to Haiti this time. And so me and my colleague, Nicole Salazar, just before these depositions, we got on the plane and we flew to Johannesburg. The negotiations were intense in those days. Would the Aristides be able to leave? President Obama, it was two Tuesdays ago, called President Zuma of South Africa, tried to pressure him not to fly the Aristides out. And Zuma said, no, you, we will not cave to the pressure. And so we did not know if we would be leaving. Then we were told we'd be having a private meeting with the Aristides. We went to a private place in Johannesburg. We met them, and they said, we're getting on the plane. And so we went to this small airport. The plane was waiting outside, provided by the South African government. All the press was gathered there, the Aristides and their two daughters, Mikhail, 12, and um, Christine, uh, 14. Mildred Aristide, the former First Lady, and President Jean Bertrand Aristide. And he spoke to the press. He had gotten a doctorate, another one, while he was in exile of African languages. He spoke to them in Zulu, in Kosa, in Swahili, in Afrikaans. And then he said goodbye, but not in English. And the press said, wait a second, where's the English? He said, we've provided translation. <laughs> and he got on the plane. And I followed, we documented this journey from Johannesburg to Dakar, Senegal, and then he flew over the Atlantic. The U.S. had been saying there would be blood in the streets. He arrived in Port-au-Prince to a hero's welcome. It didn't matter what political party you supported, what presidential candidate, the election was two days later. Haitians were uniformed. Thousands greeted the Aristide family in the streets. Thousands running and jumping and dancing and singing and chanting, welcome to Cité Soleil, welcome to Tatianville, welcome to Port-au-Prince, bon retour, bon retour, everywhere in the streets and the signs and the banners. It took hours just to get from the airport to their nearby home in Tabar, and then thousands in their compound with their faces pressed against the windows of their house that had no water, had no electricity, but they were home. When I flew out on a plane to Fort Lauderdale, it was only Haitians on the plane, and I asked them, what do you think? At first I asked, who would they be supporting in the election, Manigat or Martelly? What do they think of Duvalier? What do they think of Aristide? Absolutely, uniformly, everyone said, he is Haitian. He was our president. Why can't he live in his country? It's very important we understand the history of countries and their relation to the most powerful country on earth. And so I'll end with East Timor that Angkor was describing. I talked about what happened with General Gamajo that was in the spring of 1991. A few months later, I had a chance to go to East Timor. I don't know how many of you know the story of East Timor, but East Timor was the site of one of the great massacres of the late 20th century. A third of the population was killed by the Indonesian military. <coughs> Indonesia invaded in December 7, 1975. Uh, two days before, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and President Ford met with Suharto, Suharto the long-reigning dictator, and gave the go-ahead for the massacre. Um, 90 percent, rather, gave the go-ahead for the invasion of East Timor. 90 percent of the weapons used were from the United States. The Indonesian military uh, invaded East Timor by land, by air, and by sea. East Timor is a tiny country 300 miles above Australia. They invaded East Timor, they closed the country to the outside world, and they commenced the slaughter. I got a chance to go to Timor with my colleague, Alan Nairn, um, a great journalist, in 1990 and 1991. Um, in 1991, we were going there because the UN was going to investigate for the first time what was happening in Timor. And we wanted to see how the people would speak and how the Indonesian military would react. We went at this end of October 1991. We went to the Mopayal Church in Dili. Uh, the flag of the Catholic Church of Dili. It had been occupied by Portugal for many centuries before, so most of the population was Catholic. Indonesia invaded in 1975. So this is 1991, October. We go to the mass, the women are crying. We don't know if it's the standard sorrow of Timor or something actually had happened there. Terrible in the church. 
And we learned after the mass that the Indonesian military had surrounded the church the night before, and they killed a young man named Sebastian Gomez. And so the next day there was a funeral for him and a thousand people turned out. And in a land where there's no freedom of assembly, no freedom of speech, no freedom of press, the people marched. They followed the family carrying the casket of Sebastian to the cemetery, the Santa Cruz Cemetery. They were exhilarated, but they were terrified. You know, never had they gathered like this before, and they buried Sebastian. We went through the country with Timor. How was the Indonesian military preparing for this delegation? See, the reason Sebastian was killed is because young people especially had left work, left school, left their homes, and gone into the Catholic churches, the only civilian institutions allowed to stand, because they wanted to speak to the delegation. And the Indonesian military shot into the church. And that's why the people were so desperate, and the thousand turned out. They didn't know Sebastian for his funeral, but they knew that it was the last bastion, safe bastion for them and had been fired into. So everywhere we traveled, we heard the same story. The Indonesian military warned the people, we will kill you if you speak to the delegation. Uh, Bishop Bello, the um, Bishop of East Timor, uh, who later won the Nobel Peace Prize, along with Jose Ramos Huerta, who's now the president of East Timor, uh, told us that day that the line most often used to the people of Timor was, we will kill your family to the seventh generation. So this nationwide death threat was issued, November 12, 1991, two weeks after we arrived, two weeks after Sebastian Gomez was killed, there was a procession held in honor of Sebastian. Um, and they retraced their steps from the church to the cemetery. First they went to mass at the Motayal church. This time it was a little different. different. The kids pulled out banners written on bed sheets that they'd stuffed into their Catholic school blouses. And they said things like, why the Indonesian military shoot our church? They appealed to President Bush at the time, H.W. Bush. They appealed to the United Nations. They appealed to anyone who would listen. You'd see them walking, a girl with her Catholic school uniform holding one end of the banner, the other end an old woman in her traditional Timorese garb. And they marched that way. And they put up their hands and the V sign, Viva East Timor, Viva Independence, Viva Sebastian. Thousands joined in this procession. The Indonesian military lined the whole route. They lined this geography of pain, where every other building, whether it was a hotel or a police barracks, someone had been hurt, had been injured, had been disappeared in a military compound, in officers' homes, the Timorese women were raped. But they marched through this geography of pain to the Santa Cruz Cemetery to honor Sebastian and so many people who had died during these 17 years of occupation. It was a genocide proportionally worse than Pol Pot's Cambodia. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning when we got to the cemetery. And we saw then the soldiers marching up, very ominous. The people couldn't get away. There were thousands of them, and there were high walls on either side of the cemetery road. Only the people at the very back could run. Some had gone in to pray in various graves, the hundreds of graves that are in the cemetery. The soldiers were marching up at the ready, holding their USM-16s at the ready position, 12 to 14 abreast. The people were packed into the road. Alan suggested we walk to the front of the crowd. We knew the Indonesian military committed many massacres in the past, but they'd never done it in front of Western journalists. Maybe we could hit off this attack if they just knew who we were. We'd always hidden our equipment in the past in speaking to Timorese, because if any Timorese were caught talking to Western journalists, they could be arrested, they could be disappeared. Who knew what would happen to them? This time, though, we wanted to make clear who we were, so I took out my tape recorder, I slung it over my shoulder, I held up my microphone like a flag. Alan put the camera above his head and we walked to the front of the crowd. The soldiers were marching up, you could hear the beat of their boots against the dirt road. The people were quiet. Young kids right behind us were putting their hands up in the peace sign. The soldiers marched around the corner. They swept past us, and without any warning or provocation, without any hesitation, they opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down from right to left. Um, Alan took a photograph of them opening fire. A group of soldiers came at me immediately, shaking, waving this microphone in my face as if to say, this is what we don't want. And they. Uh, beat me with their rifle butts in their boots. They got me down on the ground. Alan got this photograph and then threw himself on top of me to protect me from further injury. And they took their USM-16s like baseball bats and they slammed them against his skull until they fractured. 
So we were lying on the road. Alan was covered in blood. They were killing everyone around us. The group of soldiers then put the guns to our heads, and they were screaming two things. Politique and Australia. Politique, because they were saying we were political to witness this, but that is our job as journalists, mm -hmm. to go to where the silence is. And they were shouting, Australia, Australia. They wanted to know if we were from Australia. And we understood what they were talking about. 17 years before, in 1975, when Indonesia invaded, when Indonesia invaded East Timor, there were five Australian-based journalists covering the invasion. Greg Shackleton led the crew. They were in a small town called Balibo. Uh, he had reported the night before, the Timorese are asking, will anyone care that the Indonesian military is invading? He said, reporting from a village I will never forget in occupied Timor, I am Greg Shackleton. It was a report Australians would never forget because the next day he and his four colleagues were lined up against a house in Balibo and they were executed. There was one journalist left the day after the invasion of December 7th, 1975. On December 8th, it was Roger East. He was reporting for Reuters in the world from a radio station in Delhi East Team. He was the one Western journalist left. Radio station. They raided the radio station. So often that is the case because it's the most accessible form of communication in any coup. In Haiti, how often that the radio stations that play musique engagée in the midst of a coup are raided because it reaches the most number of people. They raid this radio station. They drag Roger East out. And as he shouts, I'm from Australia. They shoot him into the harbor with so many thousands of Timorese. The Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. In fact, Greg's mother, years later, would commit suicide because of this. We believe the Australian government didn't protest because years later, Australia and Indonesia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, dividing Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. So here we are 17 years later, and we know it's important to explain we are not from Australia. We're laying on the ground. The guns are at our heads, and we shout, America, America. Alan's covered in blood. His body is in spasm. We keep saying America. They now stripped us of everything. The only thing I had left was my passport, and I threw it at them. They kicked me in the stomach. I would still shout, America. And I was born in Washington, D.C., and it was all there. They eventually took the guns from our heads. We believe because we were from the same country their weapons were from. They would have to pay a price for killing us that they never had to pay for killing the Timorese. There was one plane out that day. The streets were cleared. We were able to get a taxi. If it was an Indonesian driver, we would have been in trouble. It was a Timorese, and he risked his life to get us to the airport. We had gone into hiding at the bishop's residence, and Bishop Bello helped me clean up Alan. His head was covered. It just glistened in the sun and blood under his hair. He gave him another shirt, and we thought if we could get to the airport without the shirt getting bloodied, soaked in blood again, maybe we could get on this plane without them knowing we were at the massacre site. We got to the airport. We came up to the military. It's a military-occupied country, so they ran all these institutions. And they said, we need to get on this flight now. We had taken Alan's bloody shirt, and I wrapped it around my waist under a towel from the Chappelle, because I knew we'd need some evidence. I was waving my, quote, documents, which was just my tickets. Even Alan had nothing. They had stripped him of everything. And we did get on this plane. We were the last ones on this plane. And when the door closed, the flight attendants came over to me with a silver bowl of water, and they said, clean him, because the blood was already dripping down on Alan's shirt. We went through West Timor, which is Indonesia, and Bali, which is considered a paradise on Earth. But it was. And in Bali, we're able to make that call to the Western world, to the United States, to Washington State. There's been a terrible massacre. We flew to the United States with the press conference of the National Press Club. More than 250 Timorese were killed on that day, on November 12th. 1991, and it was not one of the larger massacres in East Timor. When we got to the hospital, because when we were in the road and the soldiers turned their weapons away, a Red Cross jeep pulled up. For years, we couldn't say it was Red Cross. But a Red Cross jeep pulled up, and we were able to climb into it. And she picked up an old Timorese man who they beat into a sewer ditch behind us. And every time he put his hands up in the prayer sign, they took the butts of their rifles and they 
crushed his face. And then dozens of Timorese jumped on top of us in this car. And we drove as a human mass to the hospital. This is before we left for the airport. And at the hospital, the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us. Not because we were in worse shape than the Timorese. I mean, the Timorese were so unbelievably brave. You would have, if you were young and you could run as fast as you could through the cemetery, maybe you could escape the gunfire. But there was another photographer. He was a filmmaker from Yorkshire TV in the cemetery. He didn't know what had happened. He thought it was firecrackers that he heard out where we were when the soldiers opened fire. And then he saw the bloody people running through. His name was Max Stoll. He worked for Yorkshire TV. And he just started filming and burying his videotapes in a fresh grave. He has this videotape of a young man who falls and a young, his friend stops to hold him because no one would leave their brother, their sister, their friend to die alone. And that videotape was buried. Max was arrested that day. He got out late at night and under cover of night he got the videotape out to Japan and Britain and it was the most watched videotape of, in Britain. They said it was the foreign policy issue that most were concerned about. But the American people represent the shield. You know, they do everything they can do. If they walk in the streets, they're gunned down. But we just call a Congress member, and if we can stop that killing, it is truly remarkable the awesome power we have living in the most powerful country on Earth. And they saw that shield bloody that day, and it just deepened their despair. So we got out of the country. We were able to report what had taken place. The Indonesian military first denied it, but then they had to admit, well, at least what happened to me and Alan. And then they admitted maybe one person, maybe 19, okay, maybe 50, and then you know, the numbers just grew. But after 1991 in this country, a nationwide movement grew up. The East Timor Action Network led it all over the country they would lobby in Washington, they'd educate people, show films, church groups, human rights groups. In fact, a number of Congress members said it was the most, it was the foreign policy issue they were most called on. You know, one call for his team war at the time was equivalent to 100 calls on something else because it was so rare. And in 1999, the people of East Timor got to vote for their freedom. It was unbelievable in a UN sponsored referendum. I, I tried to get in, I was banned from returning to uh, Indonesia, Indonesia occupied team war. When I tried to get through to cover the referendum, I went through Jakarta and the Indonesian military caught me and deported me. And then I tried the next day to get into Bali and they caught me and they deported me. And, then, um, and so I wasn't able to cover that moment, the, the election, the referendum. Alan was, and it was horrific. Every walk of life, every person, people brought out in stretchers to vote for their freedom. And as they did this, the Indonesian military <coughs> burned East Timor to the ground in a sadistic goodbye operation to the people of East Timor. They killed more than 1,000 people. They burned more than 80% of the house in East Timor. But the people voted for their freedom. And three years later, on May 20th, 2002, they celebrated their independence. Then I got in. And it was an unbelievable sight. In Pasitolo, a sandy plain right next to Dili, 100,000 Timorese turned out. It was midnight, May 20th. And then Kofi Annan, the Secretary General, gave a speech, and Shanana Hushmal, the rebel leader of East Timor, who then became president, now prime minister, he stood up. He had been imprisoned by the Indonesian military for years, and he unfurled the flag of the Democratic Republic of the people of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. And there was this fireworks display, and you could see the light reflected in the tear stained faces of the people of East Timor. They had resisted and they had won. This nation of survivors had prevailed at an unbelievably high price, but they prevailed. And they have a lesson to teach all of us. Whether we are journalists or students, whether we are professors, artists, activists, doctors, nurses, whether we are employed or unemployed, we have a decision to make every day, every hour of every day, and that is whether to represent the sword or the shield. Democracy Now!
very much, everyone, for coming out. It was, uh, and I want to thank my colleagues, Ryan and Manal, who's filming at the back. You can't just be a fellow at Democracy Now! without doing um, research, writing, and filming everywhere. Um, uh, and we're also here this weekend for the National Conference on Media Reform, which is taking place in Boston, where thousands of people will come to talk about the media system in this country, but it was wonderful. I also want to thank Dennis Moynihan, who is here, who um, uh, co-wrote with me the last book uh, that's here called Breaking the Sound Barrier, our book of columns over the last three years. And I hope that you'll sign the Daily Digest, which is being passed around by volunteers and Democracy Now! t-shirts, um, which keeps you updated on the news of the day. Um, and also, we send out media alerts um, when uh, various issues and breaking news are happening. But to walk over here was really something today. I almost went into the union thinking I was here for dinner, uh, but I controlled myself. It definitely brings back memories. Um, in fact, this time of year, many years ago, uh, I was going to be defending my thesis. I was just mesmerized. But I was also on this track. I was very interested in nutrition and biochemistry. I had taken a number of courses at the School of Public Health. So I went to the local school in New York City, Hunter, to take biochemistry courses. And I saw down the hall that they were teaching a radio documentary course. I thought, oh, that's what I listened to on the radio. So I'll just stop in there. And I was mesmerized. And the person who was teaching, the professor, was a producer at this radio station I was listening to, WBAI. And I asked if I could apprentice with him. Um, he took me to WBAI that night. It was 1984, um, and more than a quarter of a century later, I really have never left. I found at the beginning of my career what journalists look for their whole lives, and that's independence. BAI was part of the Pacifica Network, founded in 1949 in Berkeley, California, by a man named Lou Hill, who was a war resistor. When he came out of the detention camps, he said, there's got to be a media outlet, not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born, the first station, KPFA, 1949. Not run by corporations is uh, George Gervner, the uh, late dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania, said, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. The second Pacific station, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> so I was very excited to graduate. And, um, and as I thought about who read my thesis, these three men, I thought, it would, since I had spent so much time researching it, it probably would be important to get it out to more people than the three men who probably wouldn't be using it. <laughs> Deva Prevera, that is. <laughs> so I worked with a colleague who is also here, Kristina von Henneberg, and uh, we turned the thesis into a series of articles for the um, multinational Monitor. That was a publication established by Ralph Nader and journalist Alan Nair. Uh, and the issue is called The Case Against Depo Provera. And as I was writing it back in New York, I started to listen to a radio station in New York. I grew up in New York, but I really didn't listen to the radio when I was growing up. And as I was doing this work, I tuned into 99.5 FM WBAI, and I could not believe what I was listening to. All of the grit, the beauty, the horror of New York, and all its myriad accents. It was the best of radio. It was the worst of radio. It had no corporate agenda. It wasn't breaking every five minutes to bring you a commercial. They smoked in the room. <laughs> <laughs> he took a grab of his pipe. And he started to push the thesis back towards me, which made me extremely nervous. <laughs> and he said, Ms. Goodman, <laughs> what is your definition of anthropology? <laughs> because he said, I think this is more sociology, which I had not taken courses in, was getting very nervous that I would have to go back to school for four years. 
then it is a degree in anthropology. And I knew if I'm going to leave, I better agree with him on the definition. So I said, well, <laughs> doctor, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell me your definition of anthropology? And he said, well, it is to be a participant observer in someone else's culture. And that is your problem here, why we probably cannot accept this. Because you are looking at your own culture. And I said, no, I actually agree with you that that is the definition of anthropology, that you get a distance by being a participant observer in someone else's culture. I'm looking at the practice of science in America today, very much a white male corporate establishment. I said, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in anthropology here. Um, I wrote my thesis in medical anthropology. Uh, I was looking at a contraceptive drug called Depo-Provera, which is injected into a woman's arm uh, once every three months. At the time, in 1984, it wasn't approved by the Food and Drug Administration but it had been injected into 10,000 black women in Atlanta, Georgia, um, at the Grady Charity Hospital. They did not know it wasn't approved by the FDA. When I went down to investigate, I saw in the family planning clinic the booklet, and it just was called The Shot. Um, it also was injected to women, into women all over the world, um, millions of women. It was produced at the time by the Upjohn Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I wondered how a drug could be sent all over the world that wasn't approved here, that caused cancer in beagles and monkeys and injected in women here without them knowing that they were, well, human experiments. So I looked at this drug, and it came time to defend my thesis. So before me were three professors in biological anthropology and cultural anthropology, which I was in, social anthropology, and archaeology. And I was very excited to be leaving, and it would be in a few weeks. And the archaeologist in the group, at that time, 